Hello, students of statics. This is Dr. Dan Baker. Today's video, we're going to focus on an example of the knowledge we learned about screws in the previous couple of videos. And so we're going to take a look at this clamp. Okay, and so this is a screw clamp where fundamentally you end up rotating this arm over here, CD. And in rotating that arm, we're going to clamp the wood blocks over here at G. Now we have a symmetrical geometry here. We're 200 millimeters, both from A to G, also A back to this vertical um, screw arm. And notice that everything's symmetrical top to bottom. Okay, and we have an overall 125 millimeter radius from the center line of that screw out to point E. And you can think of basically this point E is where we're gonna apply this force. Okay, I'm gonna draw this force like we draw a force going into the page, like you're seeing the back end of an arrow. Okay, so this is into the page. Okay, and this is our force F. So all of these screw problems, they are fundamentally equilibrium problems. We're looking at an impending motion case of friction. Being an equilibrium problem, we do need to draw a free body diagram. Now draw this a little bit large. It's kind of simple, but we're gonna add not only force vectors, but also some impending motion vectors. Okay, so here I'm gonna draw my block, flatten out just a little bit for space. And then the other arm here, the lower arm, and then additionally, I'm gonna draw my threaded rod screw arm. And here is my handle coming over here. So this is point E, this was point G. In the middle here, we had point A, this is C, this down here is D, and the bottom here is B. Okay, so there's all of our named points. So getting into the forces first, we know that we want to squeeze this block with 900 Newtons as stated in the problem statement. So forces are always equal and opposite. So this friction problem is fundamentally a frame and machine problem. So we also have 900 Newtons pushing there at G, 900 Newtons pushing downward uh, on the bottom of that jaw. Now, because of the symmetry of this problem across this center line, we actually can just analyze one of these bodies instead of both. But I'll go ahead and map out both of their free body diagrams. Now, the additional body that we have in the middle here is basically a link between A and B. And if we think about this arm fundamentally as a teeter-totter, Okay, so if this is a teeter-totter and you think about that if you're pushing upwards on one side, you need to push like downwards here in the middle, okay, to resist that force. So this would be FAB, so equal and opposite here. I'll just leave that label for both of those, right, of the two-force member. Also, this we could label as FAB and this here. And noting that this member right here in the middle, this is a two-force body. It actually doesn't play too heavily into our analysis, um, but that is a two-force body, which is pinned there at A and B. And then if you could think if we're, and we're actually gonna do this coming up, we're gonna sum our moments around point A. And so if we end up with a negative moment from this 900 Newton force from the right hand rule, we'll need a positive moment over here at point C, okay? And so my force here at C would go upwards and we call this FCD. And again, due to the geometry, the symmetry, I'm gonna end up with the same force down here, FCD. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about, actually let's add the one more force here. So again, uh, frames and machines equal and opposite forces. So this is the force of the screw on the arm. We need to add the force of the arm on the screw. So downward FCD, and here would be upwards FCD. Okay, so that gives me all of my different forces. And we talked about this force E. I could also draw this, I guess, uh, let me just stick with this notation here. The back end of an arrow, so this is force F, pushing into the page, once again, into the page. All right, so let me go ahead and compute the force here applied to the screw, because fundamentally, this is going to be my W, right, as we derived our screw equation, that is the load on the screw. And so in order to find that value, 
me zoom out there a touch, we can say that our sum of moments at point A, this is going to be equal to my FCD, distance of 0 0.2, I'm going to use meters instead of millimeters, so 0 0.2 FCD, that'll be positive, and then negative 900 times also 0 0.2, um, no moment from FAB, and this is equal to 0. So we can find out that, not a big surprise, but FCD due to the geometry is exactly equal to the 900 newtons. Okay, so that gives us our loading again. So this is my W, my loading on the screw. Now we were given some information about the lead L and the mean radius R of that screw. And with those, we can actually compute our thread pitch. Okay, so we can find our thread pitch. Let's say find alpha. In order to find that alpha, we can say that alpha is equal to the inverse tangent, right, of the lead divided by the circumference 2 pi times r. So plugging those values in, we can find that our alpha is equal to a thread pitch of 3.643. And that will be in degrees. All right. And the next thing we can take a look at is our friction angle. Okay. So we were given mu sub s. But in these problems with screws, we want to convert that mu sub s into a phi sub s. And so you could look back at your notes and find that there is another inverse tangent relationship between phi sub s and mu sub s. And that is specifically that phi sub s is equal to the inverse tangent of mu sub s. Okay, so putting in 0.3, taking the inverse tangent, we end up with an angle, our friction angle of 16.699 degrees. Okay, so we know that these two angles are important for computing the moment we need for this system to reach impending motion. Okay, but let's talk about what direction that impending motion is going. So for one, we can notice that our forces on this screw are in opposite directions. Okay, so if the screw had the same threads all the way up, then one of these would be with the load, one of these would be against the load. But if you think about how this clamp has to work, we want to have essentially symmetrical motion based upon one type of rotation of the screw, that moves one of these arms, it's going to be C here needs to go up and D needs to come down, right? That's going to be the motion. And the reason those need to go in that direction, and I'll map these all the way over from here, is we want this arm over here, the impending motion of G to go down. We want the impending motion of the lower jaw here, so I'll just label these with IM, to go up. Now we're going to leave point A and point B. We're going to treat them like fixed axis pins, okay? kind of like the center of a teeter-totter. They're just going to pivot around those points. And so if you want G to go down and A doesn't move, does C have to go up or does it have to go down? Turns out it needs to go up. Okay, So that's my impending motion of C. Same thing here for D, that my impending motion of D is impending to go down. All right, now one interesting thing about motion versus forces, okay, forces are always equal and opposite, okay? So if we think about the motion of the nut over here, okay, so let me just draw you, I'll draw it in gray, okay, there's a nut inside at point C, okay? So the impending motion of this nut is upwards, just like the impending motion of the nut inside the arm is going downwards. Okay, so what I'm highlighting here is that this impending motion and this impending motion and the ones here at the bottom are going in the same direction. So now we face the question on whether the load on the screw is going with or against its motion. And so what we focus on here is the direction of this vector and this one, and then this one and this one. 
Now, an additional line of evidence is that we are applying a force. Anytime you are applying a force with a clamp, it turns out that your motion will be against um, the force applied. Okay, so we are saying that this is against. So the impending motion is against W. Yeah, you're either with us or against us. In this case, you're against. If we're against, we're going to overcome both the um, alpha as well as phi sub s. Okay, so fundamentally, our moment equation will be the first one which we developed, where our moment is equal to. Now, one thing to notice here is that there's two different screws. Okay, so not just one, but two. So I'm going to put a two out front because there's basically one at the top at C, one at the bottom at D. So two times my load, which is my, I'll write the general equation here, W times R times the tangent of, again, the summation of phi sub S plus alpha. Okay, so specifically for this problem. Now the moment comes from the force, which is times the moment arm here from the center. Okay, so that's that distance of 0.125. Okay, so from here to here was 0 0.125. So we can write here that our force times 0 0.125 pushing into the page is equal to two times the value of FCD we computed was 900 Newtons. Our mean radius, now we're going to express everything in this equation in terms of um, meters instead of millimeters. Okay, so the mean radius becomes a very small, 0 0.00125, right? Because we had a radius of 12.5, so converting that into meters. Oh, one too many zeros. Sorry about that. 0 0.0125. There we go. So that is our mean radius r. And then we had the tangent of our phi sub s, 16.699 degrees, adding on our alpha, 3.643 degrees. And so we then can solve that the force needed to clamp that block with 900 newtons of force is 66.7 newtons. So two reasons that we use screws, quite honestly. One of those is for mechanical advantage, right? We are only needing 66.7 Newtons to have a clamping force of 900 Newtons. And we know that with this teeter-totter body that has the same geometry on either side of A, right? 200 millimeters either side. The mechanical advantage is not coming from a longer moment arm, right? It's not coming from a longer lever. It's actually coming from that screw, okay? So we have a mechanical advantage. Another reason that we would want to use this screw is that we're in a self-locking condition, okay? Because phi sub s is greater than alpha, it is self-locking. And so therefore we can let go of the handle and it will hold that 900 newtons of force without us continually um, twisting on the handle, okay? So that works out quite well for us as well. Now, um, just, to, just to highlight, because we are in this self-locking case, if you wanted to compute the moment to release this screw, so, um, or the force to release the 900 Newtons, we've already done all this work, so this plugs in fairly quickly. We still have a force times 0 0.125. Noting this is now out of the page because we are going to rotate that screw in the opposite direction to release this screw. The equation looks eerily familiar. Two times 900 was our clamping force. Our mean radius is still 0 0.0125. Now for our tangent, we're gonna take the difference of 16.699, right? This is phi sub s minus my alpha of 3.643. And so to release this screw requires less force. It only requires 41.74 Newtons to release it. I'll put this in kind of a faint box. It wasn't what we're asked for, but we're just taking a look at what it might be. So less force to release it than it would take to apply that force. 
Okay, so the last part we're asked to determine if the point C and point D were right-hand threaded or left-hand threaded. Okay, and so this will get into the video that was right after the intro video, which talked about absolute versus relative motion of nuts and screws. And so if our nut at D needs to come down toward the handle at E as we turn this handle in a positive right hand rule direction. Okay, so positive right hand rule basically is saying that our thumb is going to go up along the, the screw itself as our fingers rotate down into the page, down through the force at E. Okay, so we're rotating um, around this axis from the right hand rule. Our thumb is going up the page. And so in that kind of motion, you know that if it's just the screw that's moving, that your screw would be going upwards here. But realize also that the screw and nut are moving in the opposite direction, right? So let me zoom in here. And so we can say that this is the absolute impending motion of the nut is coming down. Therefore, the relative impending motion of the screw is going upwards okay remember relative and absolute motion in opposite directions you get a whole bunch more practice to this as you get into dynamics and so if we want the relative motion of the screw to go upwards that is in the direction of our thumb from the right hand rule therefore this must be a right hand threaded screw Okay, and then the motion going on at the top of the screw, again, the relative impending motion of the screw opposing this absolute impending motion of the nut. And in this case, this is going to oppose our right hand thumb. Therefore, this one needs to be needs to have left hand threads. So one thing that's interesting about this problem, as we take a look at our diagram, right, looking at these threads here being higher on the right, they've actually misdrawn the diagram, okay? Because because of our analysis, we realized that this one up here needs to be left-hand threaded. This one down here needs to be right-hand threaded. And so let's go ahead and take a look at that with a physical clamp that's just like this one and I can show you these right hand and left hand threads and show you how it moves. So here is one of those screw clamps. So fundamentally what we want to have happen is we want to turn this handle here in a positive right hand rule direction and have these jaws over on this side get closer together. Okay and so this is actually engineered in that way. So if I turn this handle in this direction right here so turning, turning, turning. What we can see, and I'm going to hold this right here just so that only the upper one moves. We can see here that this one gets closer and this one over here gets further away. If I turn it in the opposite direction to release that clamp in this direction, we can see, of course, that the motion is opposing. The other thing you can notice physically as I move this here a little bit closer is that we actually have a right-hand thread here on the bottom part, higher on the right-hand side, and then looking, the, the thread actually switches right here in the middle. And so over here on this side, what we see is it's higher on the left-hand side here. Okay, so that also indicates physically that this is a left-hand thread, and physically this is a right-hand thread, and it switches over there right in that middle. I hope that helps kind of clarify how these overall clamps work. I appreciate your hard work, and have a great day.